Yo, let's go. What's up? Tonight we're covering Alex Garland's recent film called Men. This one is wild, y'all. This one is wild. So let's go ahead and I'm going to dive right in. Uh, this is a film by Alex Garland. Alex Garland, of course, is the filmmaker who made um, the Gnostic film Annihilation. He made uh, Ex Machina. He made the television show Devs, uh, which we have recently talked about. He also um, is known for writing The Beach with Leo way back in the day. Uh, he wrote the film Sunshine. A lot of those films have been covered by uh, JD over at Jay's Analysis. Uh, this film is different from his other films and from his um, from his show Devs, although it does have many of the same themes, but this is a much more um, a British movie. It's uh, it's this movie is very British, right up the wobby, up the wibby wobbles. The guy says. Um, so it's it stars. I mean, this one's crazy, you guys. It stars uh, Rory Kinnear, um, and he plays multiple roles uh, in the film. It's um, it's 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 a smaller film. It's all filmed uh, pretty much in it's one scene in London and the rest in Cheltenham, uh, in Gloucestershire. Uh, so. Um, Let's let's dive into discussing this. I'm not going to give the uh, usual analysis of this film that, you know, I mean, if, if you if you were to look up an analysis on YouTube and that's fine, um, you know, you're going to get uh, basically a discussion of two things. You're going to get the basic plot of the film um, and you're going to get, uh, uh, you know, the deep dive will consist of the title and what it means in light of um, the female protagonist. And the fact that she is sort of gang stalked by a group of uh, men uh, in this uh, small English it, in the in the film, it's a small English village. Of course, it's filmed in Cheltenham, which is not a tiny little village, but um, it's uh, your typical English country village. But that's not the analysis that I'm going to do because the film is highly esoteric and occult, and people that um, you know watch films or read books and and say, you know, oh, you're reading too much into it. Um, I mean, I guess people don't really, really, you know, I haven't really heard that much, but um, that, that much, but like people who would say that, especially about this film, oh, you're reading into it too much. Well then, well then what is the point of the um, Viking Celtic um, uh, metaphysical symbolism in the film? What's the point of the set design, right? What's the point of the, um, of the impressionistic backdrops I mean, the, the, the film is made with this in mind. That's the, the filmmaker's vision. That's the vision that we get as the audience. So, of course, those are the things we're going to discuss. Uh, film is, you know, the great films especially are all about looking into the, uh, the symbolism and analyzing it for and trying to explicate for meaning. So we're going to discuss fil- uh, form and content in the, in the, uh, f- with film as a medium. And we're also going to discuss a couple of uh, literary allusions Uh, that pop up in the film. And we're also going to discuss some of the obvious reading that Alex Garland has been doing. I mean, he's obviously been reading J.G. Frazier's uh, The Golden Bough and probably, and most likely Robert Graves' The White Goddess, which we're going to discuss. And I don't know if he would be reading this book, but uh, I use this book. I I couldn't help but think of this book and it's Jesse L. Weston's From Ritual to Romance. Now, we've covered From Ritual to Romance when we discussed um, T.S. Eliot and some of the grail lore we're gonna by the way the next um i'm probably gonna deep dive next because of the theme of this film and because of this uh because of some of the recent reading that and and analyses that we've done here into uh some of the grail literature probably parzival by wolfram von eskenbach which pops up in both of these books <clears throat> but um you know the film is all about um not on its surface on its I'll get into what it's about on its surface in a second. And I'll give you a basic breakdown of the plot. Of course, Uh, you need to know what the movie is about. Um, But what it really is about is essentially um, Celtic vegetation rights, uh, pagan symbolism, uh, the demonic, of course, DID pops up obviously in this film. Um, There is clear dissociation and uh, MPD and gaslighting and gang stalking there are i mean this one you know this one really um got me this one really got to got me to uh you know i've been i've been trying to decipher some of the symbolism uh all afternoon i've seen the film once i saw it today and 
I'll say right off the bat that uh, I I like Alex Garland's films a lot. I of course I love the beach. I've seen the beach you know a million times. Um, but you know he wrote that. It was directed by Danny Boyle. I love the TV show Devs. Uh, DVS. I, I really liked Ex Machina. Um, and, and Annihilation, I thought was a good film. I think that Sunset also, you know, is, uh, is it Sunset? Is that the name of the film that he did? No, Sunshine. I'm sorry, Sunshine. Um, but I will say that this film, it's hard to say that I like liked the film, but I certainly appreciated it. And, um, and I think that it's heavy in symbolism and the esoteric. So, it's right up our alley, of course, my high IQ audience here. I will say, though, that uh, this movie is d- disturbing. It's very, it's it's disturbing. I don't need to add very in there because if it's disturbing, it's already very disturbing. There's no need to add the adverb, right? Cheers, you guys. And I can tell that some of my uh, high IQ, uh, you know, uh, Chad Nerd, Cotelian, um, uh, Tristana Bigot, uh, breath, Breathalyzer, Cold Ass Riders audience will probably not like this film. You would get it and you would appreciate it, but I'm not recommending it because there are some, there's, especially the ending sequence of the film is so disturbing. Uh, it's, 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 it's gross. So maybe that will make you want to watch the film. I don't know. You know, I'm not here to like, you know, sitting movie club, we're not going to, I'm not going to like recommend or not recommend the film, but I'm, you know, I watched it for you. And, uh, and I think that this is a good one to do. Of course, we usually do analysis, uh, literary analysis here, but film, especially, you know, as a, as a, not a new medium, but as the uh, popular medium, especially one that is so prevalent with, you know, the, the, uh, the powers that be in terms of disseminating propaganda and the agenda, um, I think it's important to cover, especially when it has um, literary, when it has uh, literary connections and uh, obvious literary connections and allusions. So um, I think this is a good one to do. So uh, let's let's yeah yeah a lot of movies have uh, the symbolism uh, word in them now. Um, the uh, the the. The, the themes that pop up in films all the time, which I've talked about before, and, you know, this occurs in, in media and in art and literature. Now, the most popular things, obviously, are, you know, uh, Gnostic Jays discussed in depth, you know, how Gnosticism and this Gnostic theme appears sort of as an overriding theme in, 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 in films, in so many films. And I would say, I would add to that, you know, the most dangerous game. In a sense, this film does, again, have the most dangerous game as a, uh, as a plot line, but it's slightly different and it's a unique film, but it also is playing into this theme <clears throat> that I've seen in a couple other uh, movies recently. Um, it has obvious, uh, excuse me for my cough. <laughs> it has an obvious uh, correlation or connection to the wicker man. It obviously takes, uh, takes inspiration from the wicker man, uh, the Christopher, Christopher Lee. I, you know, I like the Nick Cage wicker man too. the bees. But the uh, original Wicker Man certainly uh, is an inspiration for this. And, you know, this comes on the on the tale of Midsommar. And uh, and also another movie which you may not think of or you may not have seen, which is a movie called Apostle. It's, you know, it's it's a, used in a blasphemous way. It's an inv- the movie's about inversion and a basically a pagan, a pagan cult on an island uh, with vegetation rites and rituals and sacrifice as part of the theme. That's a Netflix movie. Um, it's worth the watch though. And this one is sort of that it runs in that sort of same theme, but with a purely Alex Garland twist. So before I keep going, you guys obligatory, please help me out by smashing the like, no matter when you're watching this, please help me out by smashing the like, leaving a leaving a comment and, um, you know, for the propagation of the algo, get me going. And you guys, if you haven't noticed, we're almost up to 700 subs here. So please, if you're watching, make sure you uh, hit that subscribe button. Help me get up to a thousand. Right now, we're going to be part of that 700 club, y'all. We're hitting the 700 club. So, yeah. And also, uh, I will say um, that I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed uh, Jay's stream tonight. And, um, you know, uh, and uh, I love the song. Um my little girl, you my little guru, practicing some voodoo. Girl, you call it hoodoo. 
Tell me what do you do? Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's going to be the next JD hit, right? <laughs> Girl, my little guru. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, that was awesome, though. And uh, and please go back and watch my recent streams if you haven't seen them, the ones on Elvis. Uh, we've done so. We've done a. We've been banging them out recently. Okay, girl, you my little guru. Um, please also see the links um, in the uh, that my homies are dropping um, in the uh, in the chat there with uh, the the uh, PayPal, Cash App, and Venmo links. So you can uh, support me. You can also see them in the video description and the channel description. Please help me out with that. Yeah, we're up. We're 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 moving on up here. We got some upgrades coming, like I said recently, and uh, we need some whales out there to support us. You guys, where those uh, where those where those hundo uh, super chatters, right? Somebody dropping a half k super chat. We need a you know we need those whales out there. We need somebody to drop a thousand bucks on your boy here to get this channel up and running, right? So yeah, but I appreciate you guys, um, everybody who supported me, everybody supported me so much. So thank you so much, and everybody who's here watching. So uh, let's get it going. Um, first things first, um, just a plot description of the movie. What happens is basically uh, the film starts with a vision um, or a view, a view of a woman. She's this um, short-haired woman. Um, Played by the actress Jesse Buckley. She was nominated for a Best Supporting Actress a few years ago. I'm just going off the top of my head here without notes. Um, uh, nominated for Best Supporting Actress a few years ago. She's from uh, Killarney. I think she's from Killarney. Shouts out to Crispy. Um, and it stars, uh, stars uh, Rory Kinnear. Of course, Jesse Buckley trained at RADA, Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. And um, Rory Kinnear, uh, I think, trained at Lambda. Rory Kinnear also is uh, known amongst you know actors and drama school people because he played Laertes in the 2004 stage production of Hamlet at the Old Vic. Of course, when I was at Bristol Old Vic Theater School, uh, the one that starred um, Ben Wishaw and Rory Kinnear and Ben Wishaw are both in the Bond movies. Uh, um, uh, ben Wishaw plays Q and he was straight out of drama school, which was big for him, you know, playing Hamlet at the time. But of course, you won't know this, but it, it makes sense that who was the artistic director of the uh, Old Vic Theater in London at the time and who gave them their who gave them their roles and their big parts? Guess who? Old Creeper Cab Spacey. Right. So that being said, anyway, um, yeah, Roy Kinnear is really a fantastic actor in this. I mean, he is he is really phenomenal. And this movie is like an actor's dream because what happens is Jesse Buckley whose name, by the way, her character name in the film is Marlo. And we've done, of course, um, the, uh, the uh, soliloquy, the ending soliloquy from, um, from Faustus, Dr. Faustus. And her name is Marlo. And you learn her name right after. So, okay. So what happens is she is, they, they show her and she's in a car and she's driving into the country and they're playing this song called, I um, uh, forget the name of the song. Uh, it's called Love Song. <clears throat> and it was written by, I forget the lady's name that wrote it, but it's actually a lady sings it at the beginning of the film. And then it's bookended with Elton John's cover of it at the end. So it's a man singing it. title of the movie's men. Um, but Alex Garland likes to have this sort of his, one of the best things about his films um, is the soundscape, you know, the, the, the score and the soundscape and the ambiance of the film. Uh, one of my favorite parts about devs is the use of the song Guinevere by Cross. Uh, Coombsby stills and Nash. Um, and, but it really works in that film. He's always got this soft sort of, you know, uh, Anglo folk, almost medieval minstrel music playing in, in some of his films. And this one is no exception. The ambiance of the ambiance of this film is incredible. It's, it's really, um, she's driving into an English, you know, countryside town. And then, and we see, you know, the stone buildings, and she's in her little blue Ford Fiesta. And uh, then it cuts and it's playing this song about like, I need to leave you and stuff like that. And then, and then it cuts to her um, in her, I don't know if it's Canary Wharf, uh, maybe it's I don't know, wherever it is. It's with the view of Tower Bridge, which is interesting, Synchro. We just discussed in the last stream, the difference between Tower Bridge and Americans, you know, bloody Yanks calling it London Bridge. They think it's London Bridge, right? And it's a view of Tower Bridge. They're obviously well-to-do, she and her husband. And they're sitting in, he, she's sitting in a chair. He's sitting on the bed. 
and the room is red. It's like a, it's like an eerie, um, otherworldly, uh, bathed in a kind of a red light, you know, so we know there's, there's death coming. And, um, what she's basically, it's, it starts in media res into their conversation. And she's basically saying she's leaving him. And his response is, if you leave me, uh, he says, I'm going to commit SUI side. Right. And she says, basically, how dare you put that on me? Um, you know, you can't threaten me with that. And then he says, no, I'm going to do it. It's a promise. And it's really weird because we don't know the state of their relationship. We don't know. We don't um, this. Oh, yeah. This movie is called Men by Alex Garland. Shouts out to Moon out there. It just came out. It's a brand new movie. Um, and. And we don't know, like, the state of their relationship and we don't know why they're splitting up. All we know is that she says that, um, you know, they're splitting up and that he says he's going to he's going to uh, he's going to kill himself. Right. So. Then we, we, what we see is like later on in the film, it kind of cuts back to this. We know that he dies, but what happens is he, they're standing in the kitchen and um, he like comes into the room later and she's like yelling at him. And then he hit, he strikes her, he hits her, knocks her down. She stands up, she says, get out of the apartment. But then later in the film, we learn that what she says, and I think she's an unreliable narrator because what I'll get to that in a little bit, but what, what she says is basically um, they okay. So the, the scene cuts to her standing there and he is, he is falling like from the window, like in front of her. And he like looks her in the eyes as he's falling in slow motion. It's, it's bizarre. And, um, and then we see an outside view, like, uh, she goes outside, she's walking along the wharf and he has, he's dead. And he's got, he's got, um, his, his arm is impaled through a spike fence going up through his arm, like up through the wrist. Okay. And, and we think, you know, is there stigmata symbolism here? What is this? Um, and then we see that his right leg is like broken in half and he's he's dead. He he jumped he jumped out the window. We don't know whether he jumped or not. But what she says later <clears throat> is that she's there's a scene later where she's talking to a vicar, and she says um, that she kicked him out. And next thing she knew, she doesn't remember. She says, but he must have gone upstairs to the neighbor's apartment, gone through, and tried to sneak back down, and either fell or jumped. But it's weird because it's like it's not a, a skyscraper and it's just like a, it's like a three story. It looks like a three story, you know, flat and he's, he's fallen somehow, but we don't see how he was, how he fell or whether he was pushed, whether she murdered or murdered him or not. Uh, we don't know. I, I kind of, my thesis statement with this film is that basically that um, a couple of things are happening here. Um, she, she goes to, she leaves London and she goes to an English village to essentially recuperate or escape but her facial expression is weird and i think that one could read this whole film as that you know you don't the the trope about movies the worst thing you can do is to have the movie and then at the end say oh it was all a dream remember how lost i was always afraid when i was watching lost that they were going to do that they were going to they were going to go oh they've been dead the whole time right and of course that's exactly what they did because uh i don't think that they had an ending in mind which is a real sellout um and, but one could read this movie, see this movie and read into it sort of like the movie Return to Oz with um, Feruza Balk, which is that this lady is been through a mind splitting trauma. Either this happened to her or she did it. And the, the lightning flashes and the flickers in the movie sort of remind me of the fact that like the character may be going through electro electroshock therapy because all of the, all of the characters, when she gets to the English village, all of the men in the village are played by Rory Kinnear. They're all different characters, but they all have the same face. It's really bizarre. It's like that. Um, it's like that Aphex twin video. It, was it window liquor? It might've been, but remember the Aphex twin video where it's like, everybody has the same, the face of Aphex twin, go back and watch that classic music video. If you haven't seen it. Um, but everybody has the same face. So what we could read this as all men are the same 
and they're all oppressing the woman and no matter what they don't change. And I think that's the common, like sort of normie analysis or interpretation of this film, you know? Um, but I think what it, what it may be is that she is, she's being, you know, she's going through, it's almost like an MK ultra movie. I'm not saying it's MK ultra. She's being programmed, but it certainly seems to me like she, it's weird because it's like, she has the, she dissociates and yet the dissociation is what she sees. It's an image of, it's like a reflection of what she sees because everyone looks the same, even though they're all different personalities and different characters. And that combined with the SRA elements in the film, which are, which seems to me, to be pretty obvious. Um, the movie is almost purely, I mean, there are Gnostic elements within the film, but I would say that it's almost, um, you know, it, it gets into paganism and there's uh, there's a character in the film who certainly is Luciferian. I mean, it's, I think it's Lucifer. Um, and I, you could also read this uh, movie as a um, sort of a pre-Christian pagan allegory for Celtic Britain uh, with vegetation rights and the regeneration of nature tied in with humanity. Um, uh, there's a heavy element of the unification of opposites and the, and the dichotomy between male, male and female, which occurs later on in some of the sim symbolism that I'll get to. Yes. That Richard D. James smile. Yes. It's terrifying. Um, and uh, so what happens is um, she, she leaves, she leaves uh, London and my, my, oh yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to get it together. So many elements of this film. She goes uh, back to, she goes to this English village. And I think that this is the character's um, attempt to uh, escape a trauma, which she may have inflicted. And she is being, she is facing the labyrinthine fracturing of her mind. And it's a journey into the dissociation of her mind. Right. Uh, because of the tunnels in the in the film, which I'll get to in a second, um, and she is confronted by a, a demon, a demonic spirit, um, who has who sort of shape shifts. But the demonic spirit is, if not Lucifer, um, then it is some sort of um, pagan um, green man who is tormenting her because her mind is uh, uh, opened up and split because of this trauma, and. The way that the film ends is is extremely disturbing, um, and I think that the, what the ending of the film means. Spoiler alert! I'm not going to say what happens yet, but I will say what I think of it. Um, what I think the ending of the film symbolizes is the fact that no matter what she goes through, and no matter what, um, no matter what where she goes in life, she is always going to be uh, open and attacked by the same uh, demonic spirits that are manifesting themselves inside of her mind and what she sees, because Number one, she has no grounding. She has no faith. Um, and because uh, she refuses to uh, confront the past, she does sort of confront her past at the end, but she refuses to reconcile with what it means. So that being said, yes, thank you again to all my homeboys here in the, in the chat. Shouts out to everybody on this uh, weekday, weekday night. What day is this? Monday, is this Monday? I don't know. This is Monday night. <laughs> so, and thank you so much for dropping those links. Really appreciate you. Um, before I get going, somebody just uh, super chatted. So let's check that out. Thank you so much. Oh, that was our homeboy, our cold ass rider, Stephen Mulraney. Thank you so much, Stephen Mulraney. Always appreciate your support. Five bucks on PayPal. Love you, homeboy. Um, thank you. Yes, please, please think about supporting me. Yeah, again, we need some we need some uh, high rollers out there, some big time whales. Think about we need somebody out there, uh, you know, sending us five hundred, sending us a sending us a, a a grand, right? Get this channel going. All right. So, thank you. Yeah, appreciate you, Stephen. So then, what happens is she goes into this English village. It's filmed in uh, Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire. It's filmed in Gloucestershire, uh, in the village of Cheltenham, which I know pretty well um, for various reasons. And um, you know, I lived, I lived in, of course, I went to drama school in Bristol, and um, and uh, I knew people in in Cheltenham. And it's a small, posh little village or town. It's a town, not really a village. But what happens is she pulls in the driveway of this, you know, a a, a, a country estate. Okay. And a country estate to us, um, 
you know, uncouth pleb Yanks is basically a manor house. Okay. But it's a country estate. And she goes up, knocks on this old oaken door and she's met by a guy named Jeffrey. Joffrey. She's met by Jeffrey. Jeffrey is essentially Rory Kinnear in the guise of the uh, slightly eccentric, awkward uh, gentry uh, uh, landowner who is complete with welly boots and a barber jacket. Okay. And he says, you know, hello, Roger. Well, you better come on in. Uh, the kettle's in the kettle's in the kitchen. Right. And um, she walks in and immediately we're surrounded by red. Okay. Oh, the, the most important symbolism in the film um, is something that occurs when she's walking up. And that is before she walks up to the front door, she gets out of the car. She walks up to the front door and there of course is an apple tree, right? This pristine glowing apple tree. Yes. Um, and she walks up to the, uh, to the Edenic tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil takes an apple off of it, looks at it, and bites into it. And immediately we sense a shift in the ambiance of the film. And she walks in, and then um, she, she's greeted by the guy. He, you know, he shows her around the house. You know, here's the, you know, the telly. It doesn't get very good reception because of the rain for some reason. Uh, the Wi-Fi and all of the jibbly wobbles are in there. Uh, all of that nonsense. <laughs> right. And uh, shows her upstairs, goes up to the master bedroom. And he says, um, where is uh, uh, Mr. Mr. And she says, what? And he says, she says, sorry. And he says, um, well, you're Mrs. Marlowe, right? So first literary illusion here. Uh, her name is Marlowe. And right after she uh, enters and says that her name is Marlowe, we're introduced to her as Marlowe, Kit Marlowe, Christopher Marlowe. He, of course, says he does. He actually takes this line from, if you've ever seen The Office, um, not with Michael Scott, but with, um, with Ricky Gervais. Right. Um, and, uh, and he, he says, it's an old house, oaken beams, 500 years old Shakespeare. And it's, that's almost straight out of the old, uh, office with Ricky Gervais. And we get this Marlowe Shakespeare reference and dichotomy, which is to say, um, you, you could say, oh, it's a sort of an incidental reference, but Knowing what we know about Shakespeare and Marlowe, remember that Marlowe himself was uh, assassinated in a so-called tavern brawl, right? Um, at a young age, um, he was a, you know, he, he had written Tamerlane um, and uh, and Dr. Faustus. He was uh, a, an exact contemporary with Shakespeare, 1564. And he was also, um, so we think, according to, I don't know, various sources and, and research over the years um, and analysis. He was probably uh, in the uh, Roman Catholic spy network um, and he may have crossed Francis Walsingham, who was Elizabeth I's um, spy master. And he also wrote a treatise on atheism. He is a he is one of the literary, you know, heroes of of Satanists like um, Percy Shelley. And he was stabbed in the eye in a tavern brawl. Now, she gets into her own sort of verbal brawl in the tavern later on in the film. And, of course, we have this dichotomy between Shakespeare and Marlowe, or in other words, the, the fake and the real. Shakespeare is the real. <laughs> and I'm not saying Christopher Marlowe is fake. I'm saying that the, the illusion uh, that exists in, you know, sort of, I don't know, I guess in, in popular um, analysis and deconstruction of, you know, who is Shakespeare, right? So that goes, goes to f so far in terms of my analysis to say, who is this woman? Who is the real woman? Who is she? Who is the main character? One of the w weird things about this film is that we don't know who she is. Like, what does she do? What does she do for a living? Um, she has one friend and the friend that she talks to is on the cell phone. And um, the friend is uh, is her girlfriend but appears to be um uh her face kind of changes shape when you're talking to her and there's a scene later on where she is literally i mean it's this is what gaslighting is and it's in the film because um she's on the she's on the on the phone uh when she's when the guy leaves and she's talking to him to her friend on the phone you see um 
uh, the connection kind of goes screwy like it does in all in all movies involving the occult where you know the the spirits and the demonic move uh through the airwaves right the the uh, familiar spirits and the and the and the spirits of the air and we see this demonic face uh, uh, with a soy jack mouth opening up to us uh on the cell phone and her face gets distorted distorted and she appears mannish and and I, i'm not saying that um you know, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that was the, you know, as a loaded term, I'm saying it because she's talking to her best friend, who's this woman, but her, her friend's face appears more masculine over time. And the issue of uh, her, the issue of the hermaphroditic and the unification of opposites is strong um, in this film. One of the things is with the dandelion symbolism, which I'm going to get to. Um, so, so she, so, so she's upstairs and Roy Kinnear basically says, uh, where's Mr. Marlowe? Where's Mr. And she says, um, uh, oh, excuse me. And, and, and she kind of implies that she's divorced. She doesn't tell him that her husband is dead and cause it's none of his business. Right. And, um, and then he says, oh, Jeffrey stepped in it again. Did you? And he, you know, and then he, and then he leaves kind of sort of faux embarrassed. And then, um, so she has the run of this house. She's she's rented the house for two weeks. She's in this country estate. He's uh, down the lane. He's just down the lane. Here's the master key. The master key is uh, the skeleton key. It's a skeleton key, remember? So we're sort of, we know where we have all the trappings of a, of a ghost story here. And and he says, uh, but don't, no, no, no need to worry. No need to lock your doors around here, which means lock your damn doors, right? And, <laughs> and he disappears. And then she calls her friend on the phone. Now, when she is on the, oh, one of the things that he says um, is uh, she, she has put down the apple on the kitchen table and he says, uh, oh, eating the apple, have you? And she says, uh, yes, I picked it from the garden. And he says, oh, shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done that. You know, you've, you've, uh, you've, you've eaten from the tree of knowledge uh, and you're cursed or something like that. And she says, she says, excuse me. And he says, it was a joke. I'm joking. And it's like, <laughs> okay, okay, crazy man. Uh, and then anyway, then he leaves. But when she's talking to her phone, you see one of the um, first really disturbing images in the, in the film, which I've talked about before in terms of horror films. Um, the most disturbing, and I'm sort of incorporating this into the my own book that I've been working on. And that is that, you know, it's this image of she's talking to her friend, she's on the phone and you see her friend's face on the phone and then we, you see what her friend is seeing and the windows, the bay windows are in the background and there is clearly a man standing in the background looking in the window. It's, it, it is, it's pretty shocking. It's disturbing. Um, so what she, what she then does is uh, she decides to go for a walk, a long walk in the woods and the walk, the walk in the woods serves as the walk into the center of her psyche because She's walking through the woods. It's soft music. The, the movie, I'll give the movie credit in terms of the fact that, you know, it, aside from the terrifying and horrific elements of the film and the body horror and the, and the disgusting, uh, you know, proto Satanism that occurs, the movie is actually pretty pleasant in terms of its ambiance because, you know, it's like, it's sort of, it's sort of early spring, um, and there's, there's greenery, everything's sort of green. Obviously green is going to play a huge part in this shots out to the green feathers. It's going to play a huge part in this film. And we get this sort of overcast skies. We get a very, you know, it's a very, it's the movie is very English. It's, 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 it's almost, um, Celtic English, if that makes sense. And it reminds me of like sitting in the fall and watching the movie. Um, uh, uh, what's the movie that, um, Downton Abbey is based on a uh, Gosford Park. It reminds me a little bit of Gosford Park. If you've ever seen that it's sort of a, a drama of manners, not a comedy of manners, but it's sort of a, an English drama of manners, a detective sort of whodunit um, that, that uh, Downton Abbey was based on. So she's walking through the woods and she comes to this sort of um, ravine, a chasm. And she's walking along a mud path and she all of a sudden encounters uh, a tunnel. And this is a this is a huge stone tunnel cut right right you know it's right there on this uh, uh, abyss you know ch chasm path all darkness 
there's light at the end of the tunnel. But what happens is she walks in into the darkness. She takes her steps into the darkness and we see um, we see the puddles on the ground form mirrors. Now, the mirror mirror imagery is important in this film, as it is in all these, you know, a lot of the other things that we've covered. Um, and the world sort of we see a reflection of the world and the upside down in the mirror. And it's like she's walking into this tunnel, but she's also walking into the upside down, if that makes sense. And when she walks in, of course, she does this weird thing where she 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 goes, ha, 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 ha. And it echoes. And the movie, uh, the sound in this film is amazing. Oh, the score, by the way, is by um, Jeff Barrow and... Um, John, what's his name? John Salisbury, maybe it's, it's uh, one of the guys is from Portishead. If you know who Portishead is, um, remember early sort of early nineties, uh, electronica Portishead, Portishead is from Bristol in England. Um, and they in massive attack, uh, used to record in this mu music, um, recording studio where we had to record a bunch of stuff during drama school and they were there one time recording. So Portishead's pretty cool. Um, I think they won the Mercury prize. One of the first years the Mercury prize was out. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the sound in the movie is amazing. And the way that she does these four notes, it's almost like the four notes in um, in uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, right? With the, the Jacques Attali, um, French polyphonic synth uh, programmer who's, who's, you know, using a programming key, um, almost like a, almost like a MK Ultra programming key. Um, and, and it's like the same notes, but what what's weird is that the echo goes like all along this tunnel and never never stops. It it echoes and echoes and echoes. And and one thing that's weird is like she makes a another noise, like she coughs or something, but there's no echo. The only echo is the sound of her like repeating the musical notes. And this. I couldn't help but think at this part in the film, it reminded me of um, the myth. Uh, if you've read Edith, Edith, Hamilton, Edith Hamilton's mythology or Ovid, Metamorphosis, right? Um, or Homer. This reminds me of Narcissus, right? Because Narcissus, remember the myth of Narcissus. Narcissus is in love with him, with his reflection because there's no one, no one is, I'm sort of summarizing. There's nobody as beautiful as Narcissus. He falls in love with his own reflection. And when he calls out his name, the, the nymph Echo, her name is Echo, repeats his name back to him. So it's interesting that the idea of narcissism and the Echo are tied in with one another. And the character plainly states in one of the scenes, it's the scene where she's breaking up with her husband. She, he's, she says, um, like, she, she keeps saying, uh, she's she's sorry and so, you know she hopes something and he says basically like stop saying that because this is you know this is about me now it's not all about you it's not always about you and it's weird because none of the characters this is another example of a film where none of the characters are likable okay like we don't sympathize with any of the characters um the main character the protagonist marlo uh jesse buckley like we don't we don't, I mean, I didn't like, we don't have any sympathy for her situation. Um, and, you know, she's got this kind of like distorted look on her face throughout the film, which is a reaction to a lot of the, uh, the characters and the events that occur. But it is bizarre um, that like her whole, her face is sort of a mask of distortion. And the mask is going to play a part in this film uh, with some of the next characters that she meets. So I'll come to that in a second. Uh, but she she keeps doing this sort of weird programmatic echoing noise walking through this tunnel. And what happens is she all of a sudden hears this weird, like almost demonic pterodactyl scream. And there is a, a shape of a man at the other end of the tunnel. So she, as this like narcissistic character walking, remember Narcissus fell in love with himself in the mirror in the, in the mirror, looking into a psyche in the mirror of the puddle on the ground, right? And the reflection. And that's exactly what she does walking through this tunnel. She calls out like Echo, and then she's answered by, it's almost like she's calling out to, you know, she's conjuring a spirit. And a man appears like a silhouette at the end of the tunnel and starts running towards her. 
And it is, it's pretty, I don't want to say it's terrifying, but it's disturbing because he's making this weird pterodactyl noise. Um, and she turns around and she runs out of the tunnel. But what happens is, in my, in my interpretation of this film, she's already entered the tunnel. She's already crossed into the abyss and she's unable to escape. The tunnel also represents the tunnel into her mind. She sort of runs into this labyrinth in the woods and, um, and she makes her way uh, like through the woods and she tries to escape and she sort of stops and, and sees that he's not following her. But then she comes around a bend and she comes to the exact same tunnel, but it's walled off. In other words, she's entered the tunnel, but she cannot leave because she cannot make her way back through because it's walled off. She can't enter back to the center of her psyche. And she decides, she's basically decides, oh, fuck it. And she runs up the hill, like out of the abyss into this meadow. And she runs through a, a, a bluebell meadow. And it's, you know, it's weird, the juxtaposition of the beautiful and the terrifying uh, in the film. And that's, you know, that speaks to that Yates quote about a terrible beauty. And of course, Yates is specifically uh, quoted uh, in the film. And I'll get to that too. <laughs> and uh, so she runs through this meadow and then she finds herself at this sort of burned out old, it looks almost like a, like a mining village slash like medieval abbey looking village. And it's overrun by like weeds and vines. All the windows are burned out. It's all like uh, all blackened windows. So in other words, we can't see through the window of the mind um, because it's just like emptiness. There's nothing there. And she calls her friend on the phone and tells her friend what's going on. Now, again, she's talking to her friend, but is her friend a figment of her imagination? Remember, she she never sees her friend in real life um, until the end of the film. But even then, I don't think they're in the same scene together. And she's speaking, of course, into the mirror of her phone. The phone's you know face is reflecting back at her, right? So who knows if this is a real person? Um, and so she's speaking to her friend and she's sort of taking him, you know, she says, here's where I am and you'll never believe what happened. And in the background, you guys, we see a man standing there amidst the, we in Carcosa, y'all, we in Carcosa now. Yeah, come on, we in Carcosa. This Carcosa, Louisiana. You see Carcosa, basically, and you see a, you basically see um Sam Neill in Event Horizon, bald, cut up, pinhead, Satan, naked, standing amidst the, the little village, like buck naked, you guys, buck naked. And it is disturbing and it's, it's fucked up. And he's just standing there staring at her and she's like, oh, fuck. And she runs. She gets back to the village. And uh, she gets back to her, she gets back to her manor house. She goes inside. And then what happens? Um, she looks out the window and she sees the man standing under the tree of death. The man standing under the Sephiroth, uh, buck naked again with these weird cuts. He's real pasty and he's bald and he's got these cuts all over his body and he's standing there and she she she's like oh fuck and then she runs and like she she like he disappears and she's like hiding and she calls 911 and she's like or not she calls 999 she calls 9999 and they're like hello what what's your what's the nature of emergency right and she's like and you're like you're like bitch tell them there's a fucking naked man satan is standing outside call them get the get the axe pray Right. I mean, there's so much. Instead, she's like, she's like, um, yes, there's a man. Uh, there's an intruder. I think he's stalking me. And then she um, she hears this banging on the front door. She runs to the front door. She slams the front door, locks it with the skeleton key. And then uh, his left hand, of course, comes through the mail slot. And his left hand, remember in, in, in Stranger Things. Yeah, excuse my language, folks. I know it's a family show. Right. But it's past bedtime. It's 945 Eastern time. So it's past bedtime. I'm sorry for the saucy language. Please forgive me. Um, and he sees the left hand. Remember in Stranger Things season four, we see um, uh, number one, right? And he's got the left hand path. He's got this huge left hand. And his, his, it's the same in this. His left hand sticks through the, the mail slot. And it's got like this long nail on his index finger, which I'm going to get to in a second in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the white goddess by Robert Graves and the symbolism of that. 
And um, and then uh, he sort of disappears. And then the uh, you know the 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 coppers show up unarmed, of course, because it's Britain. They show up and uh, they arrest the man. Oh, they took him away. No problem. Scrubby wobbles. It, uh, no, no problem at all. We think he was sleeping rough. Sleeping rough is the English uh, term for, you know, this guy's a bum. Um, he's a psychotic, uh, he's a psychotic demon bum. He's a hobo demon. He's a, he's a, this guy's an event horizon hobo demon who just happens to be hanging out under your Sephiroth tree of death, uh, stalking you through the labyrinthine passages of your MK Ultra mind. But don't worry, it's going to be okay. And they take him off, right? So then she goes to the pub. And oh no, before she goes to the pub, she she goes on another walk. She leaves her death house. She goes on a, another walk. She gets to the she gets to the uh to the uh local church. Now this was filmed actually at the uh, at a church of England. It was uh, uh St. Michael and All Angels Church. And she walks in, it's a real church in Cheltenham. Uh and she walks in, there's the church is empty. You know, she 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 walks in, uh, walks into one of the chapels, and she walks up to the stained glass mirror, but um, and the altar, but when, before she gets to the altar, there's a baptismal font there, and the baptismal font has the emblem, the face of the green man on it. Now, the green man, you'll know from, you know, if you know anything about um, the Druids or Celtic mythology, the, or or even uh, A24, the people who produced this, um, um, A24 recently with their uh, new rendition of the Green Knight, and the green man is the the old uh, sort of an old pagan um, uh, vegetation right symbol uh, that was it, it it does appear on actual bop, uh, baptismal fonts. It's on uh, it's in a, a couple of kirks in um, Scandinavia and in Scotland and even in England, and sort of has been adopted as a sign of you know, re regeneration and the resurrection, but it is clearly a throwback to the pre-Christian um, Druidic culture. And she sees this green man face. And obviously the green man is the man that was chasing her. That is the literal manifestation of the green man in the film. She walks around to the back of the baptismal font and um, she sees, um, she sees the Sheila Nagy. Shouts out to Crispy out there. The Sheila Nagif is a, it's the, if the green man is the male uh, sun symbol, then the moon symbol uh, is the female, uh, the opposite, the moon, the lunar symbol. And it is literally, and this is a real thing. It's literally a grotesque uh, demon woman, demon woman exposing her, her body fully on the back of this baptismal font, which is, seems utterly demonic in, in terms of what she's encountering here. She goes and she sits down in one of the pews and she screams. And then out comes the vicar. It sort of, again, the vicar appears at the other end of the church, but like in a silhouette shadow and is played by the same, yes, Crispy, and it's played by the, by the same um, actor, uh, Rory Kinnear, but he's like in, he's in a vicar's garb. He's got long hair and he ignores her. Then she goes out. It's interesting that all this stuff occurs. Most of the, you know, most of the events leading up to it occur outside of the house. She goes and outside of the interiors of the building, she goes outside. She sits down on a bench. The vicar comes up to her and says, um, you know, you, you're, you're in pain, aren't you? And she says, yes. And then he, he uses the word tormented. She says, um, I'm sorry. And he says, you're tormented uh, because she was screaming. And you, you think that this guy's going to be a good guy. And he weirdly, creepily puts his hand on her knee when he's talking to her. Totally weird, inappropriate. And we know where this is going. He puts his hand on her knee and talks to her. And then he says, um, you know, you're tormented by ghosts. This isn't a ghost story, but, you know, ghosts are demons anyway. Um, but she says, um, yes. And then she tells him what happened about her husband, which I just mentioned a few minutes ago. And, and, then, um, and then he says... Do you feel, he basically says like, do you feel um, regret or guilt? And she's like, guilt for what? You know, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, that you didn't um, give him a chance to apologize. And she's like, what? And he's like, well, if you had apologized or you had, you know, reconciled the situation, he would still be alive. So do you re feel responsible for his death? 
and she says, fuck off. Oh, and before she's walking up to, but when she's walking up to the bench, um, another disturbing thing is there's a little boy in, you know, an English public school uh, outfit sitting there and he's got a plastic mask on and the mask is like the face, the mask is a face of a woman, right? So we've got a boy, we've got a, a male with a woman's mask on, right? The mask is the persona, right? And, and it's got like this weird grotesque open mouth, which sort of represents the Sheila Nagy. And then, and then, um, sorry, y'all chugging this. It takes a lot of energy to cover this film. <laughs> and then, uh, and he basically says, uh, he says, do you want to play a game? And she says, um, no, not really. And he says, and when he takes off the mask, by the way, he's got the same face. He's got the face of a man. He's got Rory Kinnear's face, but it's grotesque. He's like, he looks like a little gremlin, a grim, gremlin humanoid chimera man child demon. And, um, and she says, no. And he says, no, we'll play hide and seek. You hide, I seek. Oh, fuck. Hell no. Not with this demon. And she says, no. And he says, he basically says like, yeah, well, you're a stupid bitch. And she's like, what the fuck? Excuse my language. But that's what it says in the film. And then the vicar walks up and the guy, and he says, um, run along now, run along. And he says, he says, why don't you fuck off? And he says, you first. And then the boy says, fucking bitch. And then he walks away. So everybody in the town is, you know, demonic. And then he sits down, he has that conversation. And then she says, fuck off to the vicar at the end of it. And then she walks off and leaves. Later on, she goes to the pub. She makes the mistake of going to the pub. She walks in the pub and Jeffrey, Joffrey is sitting at the bar. Um, he carried her luggage into the house. No, 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 no worries. And then, um, and now he's going to, uh, you know, would you, would you like a, a, a would you like a, a cider? <laughs> right. And she says, yes, she's going to, you know, she's going to have a, a pint. And he says, your money's no good here. And he's just awkward as shit. But the bartender also is Rory Kinnear. And then there's two chavs. Two fucking steaky bastards, fucking steaks, sitting there. Two two chavs that are sitting there, and they're just like staring, and they also are played by Rory Kinnear. So everyone has the same face. Then the cop walks into the pub, and uh, he's like, Johnny Good, you know. You know and then she says, he says, you know, oh, I heard you went through a, 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 a hard time, you know, today. You know, but luckily we locked up that guy. And she's like, yeah, you know. And then Jeffrey's like, what, 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 man? You know, because he owns the house. And then the cop says, uh, too bad we had to let him go. And she says, let him go. What do you mean you let him go? And she's and he's like, well, we didn't have anything to charge him on. She's like, he was stalking me. He tried to break into the house. The guy's crazy. And he's and he's like, well, but he didn't attack you, did he? He's probably just a, you know, he's just he was sleeping rough. You know, there's nothing to be done. And she's like, this guy's a dangerous psychopath maniac. And you let him go. And this village only has five people and everybody looks the same. And it's all played by the same demon. And you let this guy go. And he's like, Radio, and then she basically says "fuck off," and then walks out of the pub. This is every interaction she has, right? She walks out of the pub, and then, um, then what happens basically is on her way back to her to her country estate. This all takes place in like a day. She walks back to her country estate, and uh, she sees a shadow, and it's the man. It's the Lucifer man following her through the cemetery. Um, she gets home that night, and she. The lights, all that she's talking to her friend, her phone starts to go wobbly. It goes, it goes globally wobbles again. And then she sees outside that the there are these floodlights. And the floodlights, again, this is what I was talking about earlier. The floodlights to me represent, if not like blatant electroshock therapy treatment, you know, and she's just imagining all this tied down to a bed somewhere, or you know, maybe maybe Lewis Jolly and West is doing some sort of programming thing on her. No, I'm being facetious, but still. Um and she sees the lights flickering, and this sort of represents, obviously, the 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 light in the dark, right? And it's the 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 illumination of what she's she's trying to find herself, trying to find what she's you know her purpose, or or she's trying to reconcile herself through her trauma. And outside, she looks through the window and she sees the cop standing there under the Sephiroth again, right? And he's and she goes outside and she says, "Excuse me, what are you doing?" And he's He's just standing there and then the lights flicker and then it's the demon man again. And then they flicker off again. And then it's Jeffrey and Jeffrey walks up. Hello. Oh, well, I was just coming to check on you. I saw the lights flickering or something like that. Um, and then what happens is basically um, 
she turns around and one of the fucking stinky chops, one of the one of the t- bastards, one of the guys starts running at her again. Um, and she goes inside and she's attacked by all the manifestations of this demon. Um, we also saw a cut to um, we saw a cut to uh, the Lucifer Sam Neil demon bald character, and he's sitting in a hovel inside of a cave, cross legged bald and it, it's sort of like a it's like a demon cave and he does and he's got cuts all over his face and he takes like a he like cuts his head he cuts his forehead you know where he would put 666 he cuts his forehead and opens up this like flap of skin and he puts a leaf inside of it and and the leaf is a is a dandelion it's a it's a dandelion it's like a, a leaf um and i'm going to get to that in a second because when when that you know spirit appears to her inside the house again later he's got like buds and like leaves like growing out of his skin and um and anyway so back at the house <coughs> she's attacked and um and then uh, the guy like uh sticks his hand again through the slot in the door she takes a knife and she stabs him and she like he pull she like stabs him through the mail slot and he like pulls his arm back out the mail slot and it slices is gross. It slices his hand all the way in half right up through his, the middle of his palm. And I couldn't help thinking of that, you know, that sick uh, spirit cooking uh, Marinka Abramovich, Marinka Abramovich Podesta uh, ritual, you know, and where the, you know, stab the middle finger, stab the palm and let the blood run or whatever the fuck that is. And, you know, he's doing that creepy, I'm not even going to do it here. He's doing that creepy smile with like the cut on his middle finger. And, and, uh, and then, so then we see this, yeah, it happens. And then we see um, the, the kid appear in the, she's like attacked and a raven. Okay. So she's attacked in the kitchen. She hears these noises and then somebody smashes through the windows and then Jeffrey appears and he says, yes, exactly. Jason, eat the paint. And she sees, um, she sees, uh, Then Jeffrey appears and Jeffrey's like, what, what, what happened? And she's like, how did you get in the house? And he's like, oh, I heard noises. I came to rescue you. And then he goes, oh, poor thing. And it's a raven. There's like a crow raven on the ground. It's like, "Ah." and he goes up and he like, you know, he breaks the neck of the raven. He says, oh, you know, and the raven, by the way, had, had, had flown through the mirror glass breaking, you know, breaking her psyche again. And she's like, no, it was a man. There was a man in here. It wasn't a raven. It wasn't a bird. And he says, no, no, it was a bird, of course. But he says, of course, I believe you. You're, you don't strike me as a liar, right? Even though he's a liar, he's the accuser. And um, and then what happens is we see that his left hand, he's got it for a second, it looks like he has two left hands, and but it's it's just his left hand cut in half. So it's the same demon. And then she runs upstairs and she, the door is attacked. And then who comes in next? The next manifestation is the vicar. And the vicar comes in and basically says you know he gives her a speech like um like the guy it's not funny but you remember that's that part in, in it's not funny you guys but you remember that part in silence of the lambs when she's walking in first to see dr Lecter, like the first step uh, dr Lecter, oh dr Lecter, no i listen to you right and he says um hello clarice you know and all that but you remember what the guy says when she's walking i can, I can i'm not even gonna repeat it here it's so nasty that's basically what the vicar says. And he says, um, he basically says to her like that she's a hoe and he can, you know, he like can like smell her and all this stuff. It's pretty nasty. And then he tries to uh, rope uh, her. She's got the knife in her hand and she stabs him. And I think she stabs him in the groin. Um, and then she sort of runs away. And then the demon man appears again. And, um, and then, uh, uh, she's on the phone with her friend. Her friend says, um, you know, I'm coming to rescue you and you can use that ax behind you. And she says, what ax? And then we, she turns around and there's an ax sitting there by the firewood. It's actually a hatchet sitting there by the firewood. She goes outside um, and then, and then she's standing in the road. Oh, she gets in her car to leave and she runs over Jeffrey. And then, and then um, she gets a, she, she's on the phone and the phone hangs up. And because because the connection is bad or whatever, we see that demon face again. And it was her friend on the phone, which she's starting to look more like man, like a man demon um, on the phone, the phone image. And then um, she gets a text 
from a friend and she says, just, just text me the location and I'll be there in two hours. I'll come rescue you. So she texts back the location and then her, the response on the phone is, I already know where you are. And she says, what? And she says, I know where you are, you stupid bitch. So the demon is in the phone. Is, is she even really talking to a friend? Is the, does the friend exist, right? She runs out, gets in the car, runs over Joffrey. Um, Joffrey says, you ran over me. Right. But then, but then comes up to the car, grabs her out of the car, throws her out, throws her on the ground, gets in the car. What do you think is going to happen next? She's walking on the empty road and then he turns around and he tries to run her over. She runs back in the house and then eventually um, she stabs the de demon. And then the next scene is like her friend shows up the next day uh, and there's blood everywhere. And that's the end of the movie. And it says men. Um, now that's, it's a crazy movie, right? Now, some, some people will have said about this movie, they're like, oh, this movie shit. It doesn't make any, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, you know, what, it, what is this movie about? Well, there's also one scene where the wicker man, green man has a, um, he she encounters him on the road and he and he blows this what looks like you know effervescent dust in her face but it's actually the uh the spindles or whatever of the dandelion um and then at the end of the film during the credits we see all of them sort of coalescing and connecting into a dandelion head and then it says men now what does this mean well i guess now we should look into some of the, uh, because this, I couldn't help but look at, uh, but think of Robert Graves as the white goddess, which is one of the major works of, you know, 20th century poetic uh, anthropology uh, that, you know, and then there's J.G. Frazier's Golden Bough. But um, uh, one of the things was the disembodied head of the green man, um, which we just covered, you know, in our, in our Templar stream. Remember we just did the Utramer stream about the, about the Templars. And this also deals with, um, th there are a couple of other things in here about, uh, witchcraft, um, the Jack and the green, uh, Bacchic rites and, um, Gnosticism and the spirit of the forest trees, etc. So I thought I would, I would, um, just read a couple of uh, excerpts from this book and from the other book that would sort of flesh out what this film is about. Okay. So the first thing is about the, let's see about um, the disembodied head and about the green man and about the crow, the crow symbolism also popped up. So on page 46 of this book, it says, um, it says, uh, Brand's name was guessed by Gwydion from the sprigs of alder in his hand. Let's talk about the green man. Because Bran and Gwern, the word for alder used in the poem, do not sound similar. Gwydion knew that Bran, which meant crow or raven, also meant alder. The Irish is fern, which the, the F is pronounced as V, and that the alder was a sacred tree. The third of the four sons of King Partholon, the Milesian, a legendary ruler of Ireland in the Bronze Age, had been called fern. There had also been young Gwern, king of Ireland, the son of Bran's sister, uh, Branwen, white crow. Various confirmations of Gwydion's guests appear in the romance of Branwen. And then it says, uh, the Bran cult seems also to have been informed from the Aegean. The, there are remarkable resemblances between him and the Pelasgian hero, Escapelius, who, like the chieftain Coronus, crow, killed by Hercules, was a king of the Thessalian crow totem tribe of Lapis. Um, he was a crow on both sides of the family. His mother was a crow, probably a title of the goddess Athena to whom the crow was sacred. Tatian, the church father, in his address to the Greeks, suggests uh, a mother and son relationship between Athena and uh, es Esculapius. After the decapitation, decapitation of the Gorgon, Athena uh, divided the blood between them, and while he saved lives by means of them, she was the same blood because a murderess and instigator of wars. And then later on, um, this is dealing with the what's called the Wadwos and May Day and the Jack and the Green. Because Jack and the Green, if you know that from uh, 
you know this from um, Jethro Tull, shouts out to our homeboy Jeth. Yes, yeah, seven away from 700, you guys. Come on, help me get, help me out there. Y'all help me out. Help me get to the 700 club. I'm trying to get up to 700 and then up to get up to that thousand club. Hit, hit that subscribe button. Please don't forget to um, support me. I would really appreciate it, as I always do. Um, send me a uh, super chat on Cash App or PayPal or Venmo. If you send it on Cash App or Venmo, I get a message and I can read it for you. When we get a thousand, we're going to, um, we can finally get up to actual super chats. And we're going to get that Streamlabs working uh, stat so we can start getting Streamlabs messages up here. But I really appreciate it. And if you take the time to support me, I would thank you so much. <laughs> this says, um, let's see. Uh, says, oh, there's a scene in the film. There's a scene in the film with a deer. It shows a dead, basically a stag or a, a, maybe a white heart and it's dead. And it goes into the, the camera goes into the blackened eye and it comes, it comes out of the, a uh, certain body part of the Sheila Nagig, which is Sheila Nagy, which is on the, um, on the back of the baptismal font, which represents another like tunnel vision into the psyche um, or at least into the demonic mind um, from which she's being gaslit here or gang stalked. Um, Let's see. This says, um, no, hold on. It's not that part. It is. Bear with me here while I find these parts. Um, okay, here we go. Um, this is um, about the Irish romance of uh, Gowan and the Green Knight, or Gawain and the Green. I'm going to go ahead and say Gawain. Gowan or Gawain. The eighth tree is the holly, which flowers in July. The holly appears in the originally in in the originally Irish romance of Gawain and the Green Knight. The Green Knight is an immortal giant whose club is a holly bush. He and Sir Gawain, who appears in the Irish version of Cuchulain, a typical Hercules, make a compact to behead one another at alternate New Year's, meaning midsummer and mid, mid, midsummer and midwinter. But in effect, the holly knight spares the oak knight. In Sir Gawain's marriage, a Robin Hood ballad, King Arthur, who has his seat at Carlisle, I've been to the castle at Carlisle. I went there specifically for this reason. Um, says, as I came over a moor, I see a lady where she sat between the oak and a green holland. She was clad in red scarlet. So we get the scarlet woman. And there are scenes with this lady, um, Marlo, in the film where she's essentially a scarlet woman. She's in kind of a pinkish red costume. And she's trying to be, you know, of course, seduced by this uh, witch demon who's in the inverted garb of the vicar. And says, this lady whose name is not mentioned will have the goddess... Um, a Welsh name I can't pronounce, in whom in Welsh myth, the Oak Knight and Holly Knight fought every 1st of May until Doomsday. Since in medieval practice, St. John the Baptist, who lost his head on St. John's Day, took over the Oak King's titles and customs, it was natural to let Jesus as John Mer- John's merciful successor take over the Holly Kings. The Holly was thus glorified beyond the Oak. For example, in the Holly Tree Carol, of all the trees that are in the wood, the Holly bears the crown. A sentiment that it derives from the song of the forest trees of all trees whatsoever, the critically best is holly. In each stanza of the carol with its apt chorus about the rising of the sun, the running of the deer, some property of the tree is equated with the birth or passion of Jesus. The whiteness of the flower, the redness of the berry, the sharpness of the prickles, the bitterness of the bark. Holly means holy, yet the holly, which is native to the British Isles, is unlikely to be the original tree of the alphabet. It has probably displaced the evergreen scarlet oak, with which it has much in common, including the same botanical name, Ilex, and which was not introduced into the British Isles until the 16th century. The scarlet oak or kerm oak or holly oak is the evergreen tree of the ordinary oak and of the classical Greek names, Prinos and something else, and are also used for holly in modern Greek. It has prickly leaves and nourishes the kerm, a scarlet insect not unlike the holly berry and thought to be a berry, from which the ancients made their royal scarlet dye and an aphrodisiac elixir. In authorized version of the Bible, the word oak is sometimes translated terebinth or sometimes scarlet oak. And these trees make a sacred pair in Palestinian religion. Jesus wore kerm scarlet when it's tired as king of the Jews, Matthew 27, 28. Um, and it talks about the, the sacred druidic oak because the film is essentially druidic, right? I mean, it 
you know, what's happening here is this, this traumatized woman has a split mind, which is open to demonic possession and the Jack in the green slash Jack in the woods slash green man um, is trying to possess her literally through sexuality, but also trying to possess her mind, I guess, in order to, in order to, um, to initiate a regeneration of the land and these, this sort of, uh, this sort of, you know, uh, pre-Christian, uh, Celtic Druidic demon, uh, demon world. Um, and, uh, and it, what is the, 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 um, the resolution in the movie is essentially that when the, when she kills this, you know, demon character or whatever, or stabs it, the final, uh, what happens is um, he comes out and he's like, he's like a man. This is really gross, you guys, but he's, a, he's like a, he's one of the, the manifestations and he's like pregnant. And then he gives birth and you watch, the, you watch him give birth and the birth that he like gives birth to a man, baby child, man, who is, <laughs> another manifestation that she's seen. So she keeps seeing these demons get birthed in front of her. It's really disgusting. And the final birth is the spirit of her dead husband who says, uh, you have to love me. And then she, she says like, she just gives no resolution. And so I think that what it's saying here is that like, no matter what, uh, she will always be open to this sort of uh, possession. And, she, there's no resolution at the end of it other than the fact that she is resolved to um, sort of stay in the labyrinthine tunnel of her trauma. Um, there's a section in this that deals with the hands because the hand, the left hand path and the left hand thing is a big deal in this, in this film. And this, again, this is a Robert Graves' white goddess. There's a whole section on the hand and it says, um, it says here, um, an Assyrian sculpture published in 1847 shows the year as a 13 branch, uh, branch tree. The tree has five bands around the tree, around the trunk and the scepter like branches are arranged six on each side. One at the summit. Um, evidently the Eastern Mediterranean agricultural year beginning in the autumn has been related to the solar year beginning at the winter solstice for there is a small ball representing a, representing a new solar year suspended above the last tree branches and of the two rampant goats, which act as supporters to the tree device, the one on the right, which has turned his head so that his single horns form a crescent moon, rests a forefoot on the uppermost of these last tree branches. While on the other goat, a she-goat turning her head in the opposite direction so that her horns form a, a decrescent moon, is claiming the first three branches. She has a full udder, just like the full udder or the full, the full belly of the pregnant man-woman. Um, hermaphrodite um, demon in the movie appropriate to this season because the first kids are dropped about the winter solstice uh, and the winter solstice and the winter and the moon. Yeah. Killer Mike. I totally agree. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, the winter, the, the moon and the winter solstice are symbolized by the Sheila and the, and the demonic uh, Banshee spirit on the back of the Satan baptismal font. Um, a boat like, and I'm not saying the baptismal font with that, with that imagery is not, I mean, there, that, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to think about that. Um, obviously it's a throwback to, um, you know, it's especially, it's essentially was used uh, on these baptismal fonts and in ancient, you know, uh, uh, newly Christianized Viking churches to sort of, you know, reconcile the Vikings with their new Christianity and they sort of, you know, updated the the pagan, you know, iconography and tried to um, and they they sort of updated it by putting, you know, a cross above the head of these of these symbols and saying that Christ rules over all. And he does. Um, but, you know, and then you have like, you know, I mean, it, no, it's uh, Notre Dame, you know, you have the gargoyles, right? And the evil eyes warding off, you know, evil spirits and stuff. But I, I, I just think it's I don't know. It says, um, a boat-like new moon swims above the tree and a group of seven stars, the seventh very much brighter than the others, is placed beside the she-goat, which proves her to be Almathea, mother of the horned Dionysus. 
The he-goat is an Assyrian counterpart of Azazel, the scapegoat sacrificed by the Hebrews at the beginning of the agricultural year. Um, the five bands on the tree, of which one is at the base of the trunk, Azazel is a demon. The five bands on the tree, on which one is at the base of the trunk, another at the top, are the five stations of the year in a Babylonian tree of the year published in the same book. They are symbolized by five fronds. In the light of this knowledge, we can re-examine the diagram of the hand using a signaling keyboard by the Druids and understand that the puzzling traditional names of the four fingers, forefinger, fool's finger, leech, or physic finger, and auricular or ear finger in terms of the mythic value of the letters contained on them. It says, the slight difference in order of letters between these does not affect the argument, though I believe that the system was based on the tree meanings because it is one of the ancient tales, A Really Dark Night is described by a poet as one in which a man could not distinguish oak leaf from hazel nor study the five fingers of his own outstretched out hand. The forefinger has a dew ear on it. The oak god, who is the foremost of the trees, surmounted by Lewis, the rowan, a charm against lightning. Remember, rowan is the name, rowan oak, right? Um, is a Celtic name for the ancient oak. But also, rowan is the name of the kidnapped uh, C-H-I-L-D in the movie, um, the Wicker, in the first Wicker Man. Um, says, um, the fool's finger, let's see. The forefinger has a, the oak god who's foremost the tree surmounted by Lewis the Rowan, a charm against lightning. The fool's finger has tin on it, or the holly king, or green knight, who appears in the old English Christmas play, a survival, says a survival of a Saturnalia as the fool who is beheaded but rises up again unhurt. The leech finger has coal on it, the sage hazel, hazel who is a master physician. Now I'm just reading from Robert Graves, is what he's saying in his work of, you know, sort of Celtic vegetation um, anthropology. Um, the auricular finger was probably used by the Gallic and Bru British Druids for stopping the ear as an aid to inspiration. Its divinatory character was established early enough in Western Europe for it to appear in a number of folk tales concerning the loss of a little finger or a little toe by an ogre's daughter. The hero of the story finds it and enables him to win the ogre's permission to marry the daughter. These stories occur in Brittany, Lorraine, the West Highlands, uh, Vizcaya in Spain, and Denmark. In the romance of Taliesin, is it is the little finger of the elephant's wife that is said to be magically cut off. In other words, the symbolism of the of the of the left hand, right, goes beyond just the left hand path. It's the left the left hand is divided into these sort of druidic Celtic, um, uh, uh, what, what would you call this? Magical, the the magical uh, digits and what they represent in the Celtic, in the Celtic mythology. And that's what occurs in the film, right? Because she cuts the hand in half, lengthwise cuts the hand in half. Um, and uh, a couple other things that I'll mention are that, um, let's see, the, oh, there, the green man, there are three manifestations of the green man. I'm reading from Jesse L. Weston's From Ritual to Romance now. It's one of the classic uh, works of uh, poetry, grail, lore, and um, and uh, uh, Celtic, I guess, Celtic Christian uh, anthropology um, and esotericism in the 20th century. Um, there are three manifestations of the green man, which is what occurs in the film. Uh, and these occur like, you know, you may have been to like a, someone's garden, right? You go out in the back garden and you see like sometimes they'll have like a font in the back, you know, in the back garden, like with water coming out of it or whatever. And they'll have like the green man on a wall, which is a face with like vegetation around it, kind of like the sun, but it's vegetation. And there are three ways that those occur um, in terms of archaeology and um, uh, in terms of architecture. There's the foliate head, the disgorging head and the bloodsucker head. That's what they call them. Um, these occur also on Templar on, on Templar churches in Jer in Jerusalem, and we talked we just talked about the disembodied head of um, John the Baptist, and also in the Northmen. Remember the Northmen? They're like worshiping the disembodied head of um, what's his name, uh, Maria. What's his name? Um, it's the, his name is what's his name in that? Um, one of the one of the uh, gods one of the uh nordic gods and he munrir what's his name 
Um, I can't remember who it is, but anyway, they're worshiping the disembodied head because the head, they reanimate the head by taking it to Odin. And then of course the Templars were accused of this and it was called Baphomet. And then you saw that iconography of John the Baptist uh, on the symbol of the Templars and the Hospitallers with uh, it's a symbol of John the Baptist's head with the sun and the moon. Um, and uh, that occurs in the film because there's sort of three manifestations of the green man. And he it's, it's those, ex- they correlate exactly to that. The foliate head, which is like sort of just the green man head, the disgorging head where in the film, the Lucifer demon green man character starts to grow buds out of his body. And finally the blood sucker head, when he's trying to literally um, uh, mingle his blood with this scarlet woman, um, I guess to create a moon child. Um, but essentially that <laughs> you guys, that's essentially my analysis. I mean, I've got a bunch of other stuff here, um, but that's what the film is. Um, another thing is um, that the, the face of the green man is also represented by the dandelion and the dandelion itself has some interesting esoteric connections. Uh, one is that the dandelion is called by a bunch of names, including um, the, the dandelion, uh, it comes from the Dents de Lyon, which is the lion's tooth, because each of the little spindles on the dandelion are were supposed to, you know, resemble a lion's tooth. And then the other thing is that the dandelion is a hermaphroditic uh, organism, right? It 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 like sw- is one of those things that switches between male and female, and then shoots out its spores. And the dandelion also, in terms of uh, esoteric connections, represents both the sun and the moon, right? It's yellow like the sun, and then in the sunshine and then it's it's like white and dead in the moonlight or in the off in the in the winter right um also the thing about you know blowing the dandelion and making a wish um and and uh it's also called a piss bed because it's it was a diuretic um that was used as a you know you can you can eat it you can drink dandelion tea and it's used as a diuretic um it's also called uh it's also called um, witches. The other name is the what's it called? It's called the witches. Witches Gowan. I think it's called the witches Gowan. Yeah, it's called the witches Gowan. Used in brew. Uh, used in a witches brew. So, so. Obviously, the little spindles of the of the dandelion represent the multifoliate head, um, head spirits and bodies of this one green man head. That's why they have all the manifestations of of the character of Rory Kinnear. And they're all supposed to be, you know, united as this one green man face bulb right on the vegetative, you know, spirit um, of the green man. Of course, that is a you know, it's it's purely. um luciferian in the movie i mean it's like she eats of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and immediately goes into this hellscape world right she lives in a fallen world and you know lucifer is trying to overtake her mind body and spirit throughout the film so that's about all i got for men by alex garland what do you guys think (laughs) does that sound like something you want to watch sound like something you want to check out girl you my lit girl you my guru Practicing your voodoo. Girl, I call it hoodoo. Tell me, what do you do? Right? You're my little guru. Sounds like a riot. Sounds like a, yeah, I got, sorry, I got an 830, uh, I got an 830 Raz at Dorcia, and I got a, a matinee of Les Mis. It's a laugh riot. So, anyway, another A24 film. You guys, please um, smash that like. Please share my stream. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Um, shouts out to Maddie out there. Really appreciate you. He said, he said five bucks, five bucks for Bright Lights Big City win. Good suggestion. We should read Bi- uh, Bright Lights Big City. I mean, we did um, Brad Easton Ellis, right? We did uh, Lunar Park, so we might as well read. Bright Lights, Big City. That would be a great thing to cover. Yeah, good call. Good call, man. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, uh, I'm also, um, I got a bunch of books that I need to read. I got to return some videotapes, right? Because I want to fit in. (laughs) Damn. 
Damn it, Patrick. Is that Ivanka Trump? I mean, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, you know, we should cover American Psycho. We should, um, I should get a copy of the book um, here and uh, reread it and do American Psycho, right? I mean, the, the movie has obviously been covered. Let's see Paul Allen's card. Um, no can do. Got an 830 res at Dorcia. Sea urchin ceviche. Great. Nobody goes there anymore. <laughs> the relief washes over me in an awesome wave. Um, your compliment was sufficient, Lewis. So, yeah, we should do American Psycho. We should do Bright Lights, Big City. Um, you guys, send me those uh, super chats, please, out there if you're watching this. Uh, thank you for your support. Um, let's see. Um, did I get another one that came in recently? Um, Let's see. Yes, I did. Um, yes. Again, shouts out to Joanna Brumley for that 10 bucks. Really appreciate you. And to my sister. And, of course, to Stephen Mulraney and to Matt. Really appreciate you. Please, you guys, make sure that you um, share this. Let's help me get, help me, please, you know, homies. You're my homies out there. My cold-ass riders. My, my base breathalyzers, right? Calling all Chad nerds. Uh, Tristana Bigots and Cotelians, please help me get up to a thousand subs. Please uh, send me those super chats. Uh, please let those whales out there, those high rollers, your friends, um, know that I need those big bucks. <laughs> um, please stay tuned for this week when I've got a great analysis of a film, Belly of an Architect, with uh, West Lexicon Media at Alternate Current Radio. That's going to be fantastic. Also, uh, upcoming streams with. Um, TGF, the Green Feathers. We're gonna have a conversation pretty soon here. Shouts out to um, shouts out to Maddie. Yeah, real Cooter Brown. I hope you get that channel going. That'd be sweet. Shouts out to my homeboy Jerry, the Ice Man uh, at Exposing Powerful Lies live streams. Shouts out to Mixky at Tech Noir Graphics. Please follow him on Instagram. Um, and shouts out to all my friends. I love you. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate you. And uh, I think, I guess, I think the next stream that we're going to do just before I go next stream, we're going to do is probably going to do is probably going to be parsable by Wolfram von Eskenbach, which is gr the grail. We're going to be doing a grail and Arthurian literature. I'm going back, going way back. And then um, I plan on doing either the Tempest King Lear or Anthony and Cleopatra. We need, need to get back into our Shakespeare. We've done a lot of Shakespeare, you guys. So, um, we need to do some more. We need to do some more. Um, and, uh, anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful week and, uh, stay cool out there. Stay fresh. I'll see you guys. I love you. Peace.